The men of the Comoros fish very deep in their island waters in the Indian Ocean. Their lines plummet 200 meters or more into the sea, but also 400 million years back in time. As though from the ancient age of fishes, they can pull a living descendant, a fish whose ancestors lived before the dinosaurs and were believed to have died forever with them. But just 50 years ago, these waters became a part of scientific history as perhaps the last refuge of this living fossil, the coelacanth. Marjorie Courtney Latimer will never forget that day in 1938 when she first saw this odd fish in the catch of a trawler in the South African port of East London. She was then curator of this local natural history museum. Her discovery, fished from the Chalumna River, was soon to be named Latimeria Chalumni in her honour by Professor J.L.B. Smith of Rhodes University. He was the scientist to whom she first showed this creature from the past. He recognized at once that here were the remains of a living fish of a design scarcely different to the shadowy imprints of fossils 140 million years old. The discovery was a scientific sensation and the world's press latched on to the story because similar fish, ancient cousins of today's coelacanth, were the first to venture from water onto land, the evolutionary event that in time led to our own existence. Recently, a German expedition, equipped with a mini submarine that can be carried and launched from this British yacht, sailed to the Comoros to look for the coelacanth deep in their natural home. Dr. Hans Fricker and his team hope to succeed where others have failed. From the submarine, he plans to film the everyday life of old forelegs, as the oddly finned coelacanth is sometimes known. The coastline of these volcanic islands has never offered safe anchorage. The slopes of black lava plunge steeply below water. The ocean surges dangerously in inlets, as though defying all who search for the secrets of these depths. Yet there are tiny fish here able to skip from the sea to the rocks and to keep a tight grip with special fins like suction discs. They graze on small seaweeds, a modern fish echoing that ancient evolutionary leap from water onto land. The islands were and are still shaped by volcanoes and though the fertile soils are some help in feeding the growing population of islanders, all is not tropical paradise here. The expedition's search for the coelacanth inevitably started in the capital, Moroni. Islanders call the fish Combessa, and its worldwide fame has been well exploited close to its home. Its image also jingles in the pocket. In 50 years, the coelacanth has become a legend and commercial, a local hero that's bait for tourists and scientists alike. Surprisingly, there was a time when its rough scales were used as a substitute for sandpaper here. But that was before its true identity was known. This morning, there are soldier fish and oil fish or nessa on sale, but the team finds no combessa. Knowing it's the local fishermen who might reveal most about the habits of the coelacanth, Hans Fricker and his companions journey from village to village around the island of Grand Comore. Quels sont les poissons qui sont le plus vendus, qui sont vendus le, le, le mieux Les poissons qu'on pêche en profondeur There are many questions that need to be answered before the submarine quest can begin. Where have coelacanths been caught before? At what depth would they expect to fish for them? Are the two or three taken each year caught at a particular time? Perhaps even knowing where they are not found may give some clue as to why the coelacanths living here outlived the dinosaurs. The fishermen were glad to answer the questions, and the exercise provides a clear guide to where the expedition should make its first submarine excursion. Apart from one village on the east coast of Grand Comore, there have been no coelacanths taken on that side of the island. 
all the catches have been made on the west coast and those are marked with black dots on the left. One of the villages, Ikoni, holds the catch record over 20 coelacanths in the past 30 years. From the window of the submarine, the team gets a first view of the reef off Grand Camor. But they must dive much deeper to enter the domain of the elusive coelacanth. A hundred meters down, they glide past filigree sea fans, corals that survive, though only one hundredth of the sunlight on the surface can reach this depth. There are noticeably fewer kinds of fish here. This will be the last shoal of fish encountered. The submarine drops down the steep volcanic slope, past the last few corals that decorate the gloomy portal of the deep sea. At the depth at which they were told the coelacanth should be, the scene is one of desolation. There would seem to be little for a fish as tall as a man to live on. The cliff of solidified lava now plunges vertically down into darkness. The submarine has no lifeline to the surface, but the crew risk free diving to 220 meters, the limit of the craft's diving range, and into what should be the home of the coelacanth. But none is to be seen. <laughs> but this expensive dive will not be wasted. They need to measure the steepness of the slopes, on average greater than 45 degrees here, perhaps too great for the preferences of coelacanths. Who knows? As they had learned from their investigations on land, perhaps knowing about the places where coelacanths aren't can help understand why they live where they do. Measurements of the temperature and the salinity of the water and direct observations of the character of the seabed and the presence and size of possible prey are recorded onto tapes. They'll be replayed and also quickly analysed by computer back on the yacht. The team continues to seek information from the fishermen. From these tiny outrigger canoes, they catch fish by line as much as 400 metres down. Only on a few tropical islands are hook and line the traditional technique for fishing 200 metres deep or more. What intrigues the scientists is that perhaps that's why coelacanths are known only in the Comoros, where this technique is used. Could it be there are coelacanths in the Atlantic or the Pacific, but no one there is fishing this way? Two small stones held together by a special knot pull the bait fish down. The fisherman gives a tug on the line and the stones are released and fall to the bottom.
Using their echo sounder, the scientists wish to check the fishermen's estimation of depth. It seems they are amazingly accurate. So the team decides that the local figure of between 200 and 300 meters, the depth at which the fishermen usually catch coelacanth, can be trusted absolutely. The arrival of a marlin is further evidence of the skill and courage of the men in their slender, fragile craft. A coelacanth must also demand several dangerous hours of struggle before being killed with a blow to the head. Having learned that all the coelacanths caught so far have been taken at night, the submarine search is switched to the hours of darkness. Orientation will be more difficult and the sub will be dependent on compass and its lights. Problems of re-contacting the yacht can arise when the sub surfaces, but they'll have radio contact, a flashing light and can fire signal rockets if needed. The hunt for the coelacanth begins again, the crew's eyes keenly following the revelations of the lights, their ears urgently attentive to the echoes of the position finder. And there it is. Suddenly their two-year quest is over. For the first time, a living coelacanth is seen in its natural home, 196 meters down in the Indian Ocean. The porthole of the submarine becomes a window into the past. Here is the fish that time has forgotten, whose direct ancestors slowly sculled the ocean currents 400 million years ago. The water temperature is about 17 degrees Celsius, the ideal predicted by physiologists. Its head and whole body seem to the excited watchers more like that of a giant newt, an amphibian rather than a fish. It's apparently unaffected by the glare of the lights. They're certainly a new experience in the long history of its kind. The controlled motion of its steady drift is at once beautiful and puzzling. There seem to be few active swimming movements. It appears to be hunting where the current takes it. But in the darkness of night, how could it detect its prey? And what of the theory that old forelegs uses some or all of its curiously rotatable and flexible fins as limbs, somehow to walk on the ocean floor? The watchers soon realized, to their surprise, that the large pectorals, or forefins, are used more like the wings of a bird than the legs of a four-footed animal. A long-held belief in the coelacanth as the ancestor of all four-footed beasts and ourselves must be thrown overboard. Coelacanths, with their strange underwater flight, have remained coelacanths until this day. Other related forms were to conquer the land. The submarine slowly follows as the coelacanth oddly tips from side to side and then stabilizes. The alternating movements of its fore and hind fins do follow the pattern reminiscent of many land animals. And as it slowly gathers momentum, it seems almost to break into a trot, though still clear of the ground. It's delightfully sluggish to watch, but it has a powerful trick in its tail. 
such accelerations are infrequent. Usually the fish is absorbed in its slow search in the dark. The eyes can see nothing here at night. But what's been discovered in the dissected bodies of coelacanths fished from the sea is a special organ in the head, the rostral organ. It's possibly sensitive to electrical fields. Whether they are fields useful for navigation or electrical disturbances created by the muscles of potential prey are questions for experiment to answer. Although slow, a coelacanth is quite manoeuvrable. It can execute quite tight turns. Its right pectoral, or forefin, acts as a brake by moving through almost 180 degrees. At the same time, its left forefin is providing the thrust of the turn, beating powerfully downwards. And now, for the first time, the coelacanth reveals to the eavesdroppers in the submarine the most surprising behaviour in its repertoire, a performance seen in all six of the coelacanths encountered during this expedition. last for one or two minutes. But why? Perhaps the coelacanth is locating its prey in this way. Or is it that the electrical field of the submarine is disturbing the fish and producing this behaviour? Again, the scientists must make specific tests to find an answer. A sleeping fish would make an easy meal for a coelacanth, and such a fish is known to produce a very weak electrical field in the sea just from the slight muscle contractions in its gill covers. It's hardly detectable with our measuring equipment, but such a field can be located by sharks that have the necessary special sense organs. Whether the coelacanth can use its rostral organ in the same way still remains to be proved. Were a coelacanth able to detect these fish in the dark while drifting head down over them, a sudden grab could engulf a meal such as this in its large jaws, if that's how they feed anyway. Unfortunately, the electrical fields around the submarine may be producing too much confusing interference, and no coelacanth makes any attempt to feed in any way within view of the observers and their cameras. The first encounter has raised almost as many questions as are answered. The researchers must plan careful experiments for the next dive. They realise they're at a bizarre frontier of science, a meeting of a legend from the past with our new age of inner space technology. To test whether the coelacanth really can react to weak electrical fields, they've built what is in effect a dummy fish. It's really a length of platinum wire in a plastic rod. Inside the cabin of the submarine, a simple flick of a switch can vary the intensity of the field. The dummy doesn't look like a fish, but the coelacanth doesn't usually see them in the dark anyway. But they hope that the weak field formed round the platinum wire will prove sufficient to interest the next coelacanth. 
the field is switched off and the coelacanth slowly returns to a horizontal position. The submariners are now sure that it does react to the very weak electrical stimulus of their dummy fish. They try their second experiment. The electrical field strength is changed. They feel like human goldfish locked in their bowl, peering out, hardly able to move. They notice that each experiment, at first, causes the coelacanth to turn its head away. Although the field strength is so low that it's not measurable, or enough for us to feel, perhaps it's still too strong, or too strange, for the coelacanth. It would seem they have sense organs that can react even to the very weakest of electrical fields, a means of perceiving their dark world that's quite alien to us, perhaps impossible to understand. Our bodies don't have the right aerial to tune into it. The experiments, though harmless and intriguing, are not conclusive. But for the first time, the technology of the 20th century has gently explored the sensory world of a primeval fish. 400 million years ago, its ancestors, although often referred to as primitive, probably had already evolved this finely tuned super sense, perhaps one secret of their long survival. At home in the deep, a coelacanth seems a peaceful animal. Certainly, it's no aggressive prehistoric monster. This one is swimming on its back, though with so many fins in action, it's hard to tell at first glance. This orientation appears to be a part of its usual behavior and seems to suggest that it has no enemy to fear. It's really quite amazing that the coelacanth seems not to notice the comings and goings of the submarine. Somehow, over the millennia, while an ocean of modern predatory fish evolved around them, coelacanths have survived at peace in the deep. Slowly, it rolls over to what we might regard as a normal swimming position. The watchers are again looking closely to see if those fins make contact with the ground. But no, old forelegs stays well afloat. There are moments when a coelacanth rests on the bottom, but even then, the paired fins are not used in any way as legs, but only as rudders. It's the other fins that provide propulsion. So, the world of science is accepting that today's coelacanths are not the missing link between fish and four-footed creatures. But in this slow progression up the deep slope of Grand Camor, the way the paired fins are moved seems just one step away from the clambering gait of a newt or a lizard on land. The crucial step that was taken by an air-breathing relative of these coelacanths 400 million years ago. The eight and a half hours of contact with the coelacanth are too brief to reveal all the secrets of their lives. But almost every moment presents a new question. What does the rhythmic beating of the small extra tail fin signify? It starts when the fish is lying on the bottom. Is it perhaps producing electrical fields from its muscle movement that the coelacanth can use for orientation, a kind of natural radar? That must remain a speculation.
Hans Fricker describes this remarkable first meeting as little more than a social call, enabling us and the coelacanth to make one another's acquaintance. It has dispelled one cherished myth, but is a start to the dozens of fascinating discoveries still to be made. A first suggested conclusion as to why the coelacanths have survived here is that scarcely any other fish could find sufficient food in such a barren, dark volcanic region. Their submarine has given them access to that underworld, and they realize they've only just begun to know the coelacanth, the combessa that the Comoro Islanders helped them to find. A new chapter has begun in the long history of the coelacanth. But already there's a possibility that it's the last. No one yet knows how many there are. Hans Fricker believes it would be prudent not to take them from the sea until much more is known of their lives in the deep. <laughs> 